Wait, is that picking up my microphone? And mine. Okay, we're live now. All right. Thanks for coming, Doug. You can go ahead and get started because you know your own name. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks. Hi, everybody out in Radio Land. Um, my name is Doug. Uh, you may know me as Preaction. Um, I am, I've got two talks, actually, for you here today. Um, they're short talks, so we'll still get out of here on time. Um, but uh, we're going to start out here with uh, um, getting the most out of Travis CI. Um, has anybody here heard of uh, Travis? Yes. Okay, so uh, everybody except the people who don't want to raise their hand uh, has heard, at least heard of Travis. Um, so uh, Travis CI is uh, continuous integration, which is automated testing. Um, basically lets you test every change for your GitHub project. And it's totally free. So if you're not using it already, you might want to start. And that's entirely what this is about. Um, so I guess how many of you people who know what it is are actually using it? Just started using it. Okay, that's a little better. Now I have some actual reason to give you this talk. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Travis is continuing integration, and uh, it's unfortunately it's GitHub only. Um, so if you are not using GitHub, you really cannot use Travis. Um, if you are using GitHub for free, on the other hand, you can use Travis for free. Um, so if you're, uh, uh, you're doing open source on GitHub, uh, you can get Travis integration for free. Um, if you're using GitHub Professional or GitHub uh, Enterprise, you must buy Travis Enterprise, um, which is obviously how they make their money, um, but you can still use Travis. Um, so Travis has a config file, which is travis.yaml, um, and here's where you define that, hey, we're a Perl project, our language is Perl, um, and hey, we're going to test on these versions of Perl, uh, so we're going to test on 5.16, 5.18, and 5.20, which is now out of date. These are no longer supported by uh, P5P. I need to put 5.22 and 5.24 in here. Um, and the minimal thing we need to do is, uh, is this one line here. This before install, we're going to... Uh, who here is a systems administrator? Okay, so... So both of your hackles are probably raised by this line. Um, uh, so this curls down a shell script, runs it, and gives it an argument, which if you don't trust, uh, well, specifically if you don't trust Graham, uh, you probably do not want to do this. Um, so this is the bare minimum of uh, uh, Travis. All you have to do is put this file into your project on GitHub, Maybe I should remember what this actually, uh, uh, what this talks about. So the language is Perl. Uh, Travis supports a whole lot of languages. Perl gives us the array of versions. The latest 5.20. Um, this is pre-built. This is actually provided by Travis, uh, which means that it actually comes with a bunch of non-core modules. Um, for example, it comes with a version of distzilla, because that is a common thing for people to want. Um, but this can actually come uh, with some problems. Um, there's also a build time limit. So if your builds take longer than 50 minutes, it's going to time out and it's going to fail. This is the free version of the thing. Uh, so you can, if you want, specify that you want uh, 5.20.1. And this will actually get you a pre-built Perl, but from, uh, uh, from Travis Perl, from the, uh, the Perl Travis project which I'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, so if you specify three version numbers, you get no non-core modules. Um, this is going to be a slower build, which means that if you ever reach that 50 minute time limit, your build will fail. Um, but this is important for when you need to test, um, when you need to test your dependencies. Like the entire reason I use Travis is really to test to make sure that I'm declaring my dependencies correctly. Because it's hard to do that on your laptop where, hey, I want to use this new dependency. Okay, I'll install it. Okay, did I remember to put that into my build.pl? Travis is what I use to solve that problem. Uh, until, of course, this uh, non-core modules started coming up. Uh, so you can also specify that you want threaded pearls. 
um, threading pearls, non-threaded pearls. This is a, an important distinction, especially if you're using XS. Um, so if you need to make that distinction, you can make that distinction. Uh, you can also just specify the word dev, which will be the latest dev release. Uh, currently, this again is out of date. It'll be 5.25.1 now. Um, we are into the 5.25s. Uh, and finally, if you want to, you can actually git bleed, which is the latest Perl uh, uh, from the git repository where Perl lives. It'll download it, it'll compile it, and it'll run your tests against it. Um, this actually doesn't take that long. Um, maybe takes 5, 10 minutes. Uh, so if you want to make sure that your uh, your code runs on the latest development version of Perl or the latest you know uh, uh, master Git master for Perl, uh, you can say bleed. Um, so there's a line in there called pseudo false, um, and so by default Travis gives you uh, basically a standard Ubuntu and allows you to do whatever you want with it. Uh, but if you disable pseudo, you can actually get faster builds because they can use a container that doesn't have anything that you don't need. Um, so Travis has containers, and they can just spin one up, and since you don't have pseudo access, they know that you can't actually break anything. Um, so they use Ubuntu 12.04, uh, server edition 64-bit. Uh, you can get some details on the website here. Um, I'll post these uh, slides to the uh, meetup, so you can click on all these links that I've gotten here. Um, so no pseudo allows them to easily clean it up, allows you to have a faster build. Uh, but you can, if you want, use sudo to install prereqs. For example, if you need to install a database, uh, if you need to install libssl, if you need to install anything you need, you can use sudo, you can use apt-get, and you can install that. Uh, so now the last line in that was the before install. And here's where we did the very dangerous thing. Um, and this is where we get the Travis Pearl helpers. So um, the Travis Pearl helpers will automatically build just about everything you need. Are we worried about the light? Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, so it will automatically build, and it will run your tests. Uh, any CPAN style disk will work. So uh, basically, if you've got a build.pl, if you've got a makefile.pl, if you're using module build, XUtils make maker, module install, Y, um, it will work with this just uh, default uh, CPAN testers, which of course I always say. Uh, it'll also work with Distzilla. Um, so if you've got a Distzilla dist, it'll see the dist INI, it will run your distzilla build, get your make file, and do everything it needs to from there. Uh, which is also actually pretty good in testing your distzilla stuff itself. Uh, uh, so to enable Travis, you have to go to GitHub, or you have to go to travis.ci.org. Uh, you sign in with GitHub, and it links your accounts. And then it brings you to this page, which allows you to click the little switch next to your repository. All you got to do is, is flick the switch, and you're done. Any questions about uh, getting started? All right, so the, uh, the Travis build is actually set up into phases. Uh, we had the before install phase before. Uh, so this is the uh, short version of a Travis build. And here is the longer version of a Travis build. Um, so the before install step runs, uh, uh, obviously, before in your install. Uh, so this is what's going to uh, set up your build environment uh, get any of your uh, installation prereqs. Um, this is what's going to uh, uh, build your Perl. Uh, so if you specify a Perl that isn't pre-built already, it will build a new Perl for you, for example, bleed. Um, it runs Perl-V here, just to say, here's what my Perl is built with, here's all the uh, uh, comp compilation settings and all that kind of stuff you'll need for uh, debugging. Uh, it'll build your distribution, and then it'll go into the build directory. So this sets up your build, and then you install. First you install your prereqs, and then you install your coverage prereqs. Uh, so we're also going to get a uh, coverage report out of this. We're going to make the most out of this. And then we have a script. 
Uh, so the script is what runs for our tests, and we've got before script and after success. Uh, so before script, we set up our coverage, which basically means ensuring that the uh, um, the uh, devel cover is all there and set up. And then we run our approve uh, over all our test files, and then we run our coverage report. And obviously, each one of these steps is a shell script, and you can customize it however you like. Um, so in addition, this is, this is kind of the simple way of doing it. Uh, basically, you've got your, your, your versions of Perl, and you've got the entire script. Um, Travis also has uh, this, this feature called the matrix. Uh, and this allows you to customize each version or, you know, um, different parameters of your build. So, for example, um, if you want to build with a special environment, um, I know a few projects who turn on features with environment variables. Uh, so you can say that I want to test with these environment variables, with these environment variables, with these environment variables, and get the results that way. Um, you can also test... Um, what do we got here? Right. Uh, so this is what I do to get my coverage reports. Is I actually um, I use the build matrix, and for Perl 5.18, which was kind of the latest version of Perl when I wrote this, I set coverage equals one to run the coverage report. Um, if you've used Develop Cover, you know that it is at least ten times slower than running any of the other tests. So this allows us to say, okay, well I only want to run coverage on this one Perl, um, and indeed I can also allow it to fail and say, hey. It doesn't matter if this fails because sometimes coverage doesn't work right. There's some incompatibility or uh, otherwise that makes it fail. Um, so this actually automatically sends to coveralls.io, which is also free if Travis is free and GitHub is free. Um, and this allows you to see uh, your coverage in a nice web app um, and so on. Of course, you could just ship those off to you if you wanted. Your mileage may vary. So I can actually show you all this stuff uh, later here at the end about uh, one, of my, uh, one of my distributions. Um, so one of the major reasons uh, to use Travis is optional prerequisites. Um, so you, know, you can, on your own laptop, test all your prereqs and then you know, use modules to figure out, OK, we'll, you know, we'll use a different Perl that doesn't have our prereqs, and we'll set that all up. But you can then use Travis just to automate all this. Um, so to test optional prereqs, I use a module called Devel Hide, um, which hides modules from require. So when you try to require the module, it says no. It actually dies with an error message saying that it's hidden. Um, so to set this up before install, we set up, uh, we install our Devel Hide. Uh, we're going to add some uh, environment variables here. We're going to load devel hide every time. And then we're going to make it shut up about itself. And then in the matrix now, I'm going to say, well, take this version of Perl and during this run, hide this Perl module. So now when this build runs, it tries to load this module, and hopefully it will, during the tests, uh, fail gracefully or, or <coughs> rather skip gracefully. Um, so then in my Staticles uh, project, for example, there are four or five different optional prerequisites. Uh, every single test that tests those prerequisites says, skip, you must need you know, this module to run this test. Um, so there are a lot more ways uh, you can make the most out of Travis. Um, you can actually build a completely custom Perl. Travis comes with Perl Brew, so if you want to set any compiler flags, uh, install any modules, uh, use debugging, the debugging flag, um, maybe you're debugging a memory uh, uh, problem in Perl itself, uh, you can do that if you want. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, you mentioned a bunch of stuff about including dependent modules, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't hear you mention Parton specifically. I imagine if you did that, 
you would just probably include something in like your install step to just start right. to install. Yep. So you could um, yeah. So basically, as part of your steps, what you could do. Mm -hmm. So I like this uh, presentation software, but getting back through it is apparently impossible. Ah, here we go. Nope. Up, up, up. Right. So here, uh, the install is probably where you'd run carton install. Um, before install is where you'd run, you know, cpanm carton to get carton itself. Uh, and then you run carton install instead. Uh, and then your script would be carton exec prove and all that. Yep, you can totally do that. Uh, how does Travis CI make money? They have a private plan yeah. that people can pay for? Right. Yeah. So if you're using GitHub Enterprise uh, with private repositories, you will need, and you want to use Travis, you will need to pay for Travis Enterprise. Okay. Um, that is their uh, essentially their business model. Oops. I'm going virtual here. Do -do -do. So this is my Travis. Let's add a repository. Ah, travisci.com is where you get. Uh, so you got that .com.org difference. Oh, okay. So yeah, here's where uh, their enterprise version of the app works. And I would hope, hope, hope that they have a version of this that doesn't require GitHub. Because I mean, personally, I don't think it's it's fully useful if, if it's requiring your code to be up on GitHub, um, because otherwise I'd have to run Jenkins, and Jenkins is kind of a pain. But yeah, so this is uh, this is how they do. Expensively, well, good to know. Any other questions? Why is it called Travis? That is an excellent question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do have they do have the dude, so. Maybe that guy's Travis. I mean, he's wearing a T on his helmet, so. Yeah, that's for Tom actually. Tom the Builder. I. <laughs> uh, like, how do you use this, like, in your day to day? Um, so the most, uh, so I can actually show you if this is, let's see. When I say, how, like, what is it, what is it providing you that's, that's useful? Like, I realize, like, it's, it, it's telling you whether or not your test pass or fail. It's kind of giving you a coverage report. Right. So that's actually not as useful to me because I run my tests before I commit. But um, what this does is it catches all the edge cases that I've found. Uh, for example, uh, 5.10 has different things. Like, there are things that do not work on Pro 5.10. And uh, specifically, like, there are, like, non-core modules and, uh, um, that are different for 5.10. And so I have this, uh, uh, this specific three-part version to ensure that I get a core-only Perl that makes sure that I have the right versions of my, my non-core modules that work on 5.10.1. Um, this was a bug with Path Tiny. Um, I've had uh, quite a few bugs with Path Tiny that have required me to up the version continually. Um, here I have the latest uh, version that's also three part, just to make sure that uh, all of the core modules that I, I depend on are are correct. Um, like I said before, I have some optional prereqs that I want to make sure that I uh, uh, test correctly because you should be able to install my my uh, my package without these things. Um, what else? Right. I should then show you. Um, so Ribasushi, uh, Peter Rabbitson, runs DBIX class, and they have their own Travis.yaml, um, which is quite a bit bigger than mine. Um, indeed, they uh, they run their own mod. Uh, they run their own. Uh, they run their own scripts. And uh, they've got a whole bunch of other pearls. Uh, you can see they run a C pearl, which is that's Rainy, I think. Rainy Urban's fork of Perl. Um, looks like they also got Schmorp's stable Perl fork. 
Um, but here they really use the matrix to its ultimate. Uh, and this is where I was saying, uh, mentioning the uh, uh, the feature flags in the environment this is what they do. So all these environment variables are, in fact, feature flags um, that exercise or hide bugs that they then use. Um, so the idea is much like any other continuum integration. The idea is that your dev, you know, you want to tighten their dev cycle so that they only have to run the tests that they're concerned about on their laptop, and it's pretty good. You get, you know, 95 to 99 percent of the problems, but then you throw it up on Travis here, and you get, you know, three or four extra nines because this thing knows about all of those previous bugs that can only be caught at build time. Right, like here. Um, so not only is he using iThreads, he's also uh, uh, used more bits, which I have no idea what actually does. But yeah, you can see a lot of the uh, um, threaded versus non-threaded pearls in DBIX class. We're testing back here to 585 threaded, 584 non-threaded of a Solaris-like pearl. Um, and the point is, is that you, like, first off, you don't have all these things on your own laptop. And if you just, you know, you're trying to write a new, you know, test case or you're trying to just add a quick feature, you don't want to test all this yourself. You might not even be set up to test it all. But you've got this Travis here that will do it. Um, so Travis actually gets invoked during a pull request. So when you open up a pull request, uh, uh, Travis will test your code, and then if it fails, send a, 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 an issue to you saying that, hey, we tried to test your code for your pull request, but it failed. Here are the problems. Um, so that way you can basically use uh, Travis as kind of a pull, re uh, pull request review system. Yeah, now I'm interested. Anybody know what Use More Bits actually does? <laughs> no idea. Oh, right. I keep forgetting about notifications. You can actually send out uh, IRC notifications, um, email notifications, of course. Um, looks like you can smoke different branches. I've never used that. Oh, you can exclude branches. By default, it, it smokes them all. Hopefully, except GitHub pages, but... Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's generally the, the benefits of all continuum integration uh, systems, except that this is hosted, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, no idea, and I don't actually, like, I don't know if I can actually, like, look at that. I'd have to... So yeah, so here, here you can see... Travis has tested this, and I can open up the details, and elapsed, uh, so this build, total time, one hour, 35 minutes. But I mean, there's quite a few different tests, and all these ones are allowed to be failed, um, but they pass anyway. Um, I suppose just to kind of show what this looks like, you can see um, all the information and some of it's hidden by default because it's not as uh, like some of the, the earlier steps, the before install step, the, uh, uh, the before stage step, those are all hidden by default. <coughs> and then here's the main step where it's... Yeah, um, Peter is a bit... I hesitate to call it paranoid, but uh, DBX class does work back to 5.6, so there's that. But you can see a lot of skips for optional dependencies, but this is the standard proof output. And then I don't know if he uses coveralls or not, but I know I do. So I can go to cover all files. And they don't save my login nearly as much as Travis does. But every single uh, 
Every single commit gets pushed here. And I can actually see coverage went up. These files were changed, but the coverage didn't change. Uh, and much like if you've used uh, develop cover, you can get line by line. Nice. Uh, line by line coverage and how many times that line was uh, was accessed. So yeah, obviously all things you can do yourself, but it is kind of nice that this all just kind of happens. Um, and the, the Perl Travis helpers um, make it a lot easier to do. So any other questions, comments, scathing rebuttal? So this is available for Right. Nope. As far as I know, it is only hosted. Um, I don't know whether or not the enterprise version is available as a um, um, as a server. I know GitHub will like install their stuff on your own servers, um, but I'm not sure that Travis will. Uh, but at that point, um, I, I misspoke. Jenkins isn't really that bad. Um, there is a learning curve involved, um, but like just getting it going, as long as you can get Java installed, Jenkins will work. It's getting Java installed is kind of a pain in the ass. Um, so actually, well, because actually getting Java installed is such a pain in the ass, especially on headless FreeSB, uh, FreeBSD systems, um, I've never actually been able to successfully do that. Um, I've started, or rather, I started work on um, on a Perl-based continuum integration system I called Cradle. Um, I unfortunately have not yet uh, been able to release that out to CPAN. Um, but if anybody's interested, I can uh, uh, help get what needs to be done. Like, it'll run jobs, but it's not quite, like, ready for prime time yet. Um, Mainly because I think it'd be nice for pro programmers, if you have CPAN, you just CPAN install my continual integration server, and it's there. Which is a little easier to install than Java. Um. All right, so anything else, Travis? All right, I have no idea when I started, so I have no idea if that was a 20-minute uh, minute talk or not. Uh, but this time, I will actually write down when I'm starting, so I know that this one is a 20-minute talk. We can go back and watch the video. <laughs> right, there's a freaking video. Look at that. Yeah. That was 30 minutes of video questions. 20, 20, 18 minutes when you finish. I need all these questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right. Let's next thing is in my talks directory. I have an introduction to three things in my talks directory. Okay. And collector dot. Let's reload this. All right. So Rex. Um, has anybody here heard of Rex? I heard someone is actually using it. Yeah. Excellent. Um, how about, has anybody heard of Puppet, Chef, Ansible? We've heard of those things. Okay. Um, so Rex is uh, along the same vein. Uh, Rex is about uh, running tasks uh, on different servers um, with the end goal of providing a deployed server or uh, really just running tasks. Um, the Basically, the biggest place that I used Rex uh, we didn't have any root access to actually install anything, uh, so we weren't allowed to install files, we weren't allowed to install packages, and so I only used Rex to automate my deployment, uh, which means that I was just basically, you know, get down, uh, downloading all our stuff uh, uh, from Git, running all the, the tests, and then actually installing our app. Um, so Rex uh, kind of excels at running tasks. 
um, and we specify those tasks in a rex file. Um, so much like a make file or a vagrant file or a docker file, we have a rex file. Um, if you have all of those files, you might want to consider something else. But um, uh, So the rex file allows us to say uh, um, that we have a task called df, um, and in that task, what we're going to do is we're going to run uh, df dash capital H. Uh, so I'm going to check how much free disk I have in my user directories. Um, I only now realize that all of these uh, bank-specific examples, I was working at Bank of America at the time, all of these bank-specific examples are terrible because uh, they reveal how terrible the bank was. Um, and in order for people to properly understand them, I have to explain how terrible the bank was. Um, suffice it to say that there was a bunch of, of hard drives, and they were all mounted at user 2, user 3, user 4, and user 5. Um, and so this gave us, uh, and we had, we had full access to those hard drives, so we had to constantly keep uh, looking, checking the disk uh, free on these drives. Uh, we were a data warehouse, and that was how they provided us with, uh, uh, with spinning rust. Um, so what this will do is it will run df-h, and it will just simply print out the output. Um, so if I run that, uh, I use the rex command to run my tasks. I can just simply do rex and then the name of the task. And here is the output of that task um, for the box. Um, now this task is actually running on my local machine because I didn't tell it to do anything else. Uh, so this was my laptop. No? Yes? No. I don't know. But the important bit is that we want to run this on another host. Um, so what we can do using Rex is we can actually specify using dash capital H the host that we want to run our task on. So now if we run this task on our QHDADAP01, see this is where I'm telling you i got to change these examples. Uh, we log into the box. Uh, we actually use SSH to log into the box, uh, and then we run that script, and this provides us with our hard drives that we expect and all the output of the command. Uh, we can actually specify that we want to run it on multiple hosts at the same time. Uh, so we can say that we have, uh, in prod, we have 01 to 04. We have four production boxes, and we can run DF on all of them. Um, so the fun thing about Rex, we'll get to that later, uh, the fun thing about Rex is that it uses SSH, and it does not require anything on the target machine, except an SSHD. So if you, your personal account, can log into that box, you can use Rex to run a command on that box. Uh, obviously, if you want to run certain commands with sudo, you're going to need sudo access. Um, if you want to run certain other commands, you may need a Perl interpreter on that box. Um, but by and large, you need nothing on the target machine except an SSHD. Uh, so first, um, uh, so in addition to running tasks, basically the two kind of things to do when uh, deploying something to a server is to run scripts and deploy files. Um, so Rex also allows you to deploy files. I can create a task. Let's call it deploy www which will deploy our website. Um, and this will take a file, and the, the target location is our httpd.conf. We're going to ensure that it's there, and we're going to take the source from our local file, etsy httpd.conf. So all this is going to do is going to take our local directory and copy that file to the remote system. Uh, but that's, uh, we can also run callbacks when we're deploying. Uh, especially for Apache, if you update the uh, configuration, you need to restart Apache. So we can say that once it's changed, we're going to run Apache Control Restart. Which, if I'm using Debian, I need to call it Apache 2 Control. But anyway, that's a talk for another day. <laughs> uh, but we can also generate our files from templates, which is really handy if you need to deploy uh, the same similar HTTP comps to a bunch of all, uh, a bunch of different servers. And we can grab our template from our local HTTP conf. We can give it some variables. I'm just going to give it the current server. And then it will, you know, set the server name correctly, 
uh, and then upload it to where we need it to be. Um, I don't go into the uh, configuration file, or sorry, the template language. Uh, but it's very similar to Modulicious, or basically it's, it's template toolkit with angle brackets instead of square brackets. I think they specifically use template tiny, which is ripped from Mojo template. Um, so specifying that host on the command line every time is going to be a pain in the bottom. So we can actually use our Rex file to configure named groups of hosts. Um, so I can say that I have a group called Ops Prod. Um, Ops is the team that I was on. Prod is you know production. Um, UAT user acceptance testing. It's our staging. I don't know why we had different uh, names for everything, but we did. And then dev. So we've got uh, prod, staging, and dev boxes. And then we can run the tasks that we have on those groups. So rather than specifying a single host name, I can say, I want to run this group, and it will run the task across the entire group. So if I want to check the disk free on every dev host, and then I can see that I get my DF output from every dev host. And this was one of the first things I actually had to do with Rex, um, because as a data warehouse, we needed disk space everywhere. Um, but the bank had a policy, or still probably has a policy, where you're not allowed to ask for new disk space unless someone else gives up disk space. Uh, they had a zero data growth policy. So as you might imagine, it result, uh, results in people basically hoarding their own disk space. Uh, so over the course of about 10 to 15 years, we had a guy, um, uh, my boss, would, like anybody had a, a server they were getting rid of, he would just take it. Like, uh, he would take every server. We, we, we never used them, we never ran anything on them, but we had them, because then we had the disk space that was on them. Uh, so when it came time to get more disk space, we could say, okay, well, we'll give you these servers that we're not using. I mean, we're totally using. Um, <laughs> and you give us more disk space on these other servers. Um, so the first task I wrote was to uh, run DF on every single server I could find, uh, which, interestingly enough, Rex worked on Red Hat 4, Red Hat 5, Solaris 8, Solaris 9, I think that was it. Thank God. But it worked on, on some boxes. I, I, I totally would not have expected any modern uh, uh, anything to work on. Like, on those Solaris 8 boxes, I found running Perl 4 scripts. So, <laughs> uh, so in addition to groups, I can actually configure environments. Um, and this is a way for me to say that my dev environment uh, has a group of, of servers, uh, like we have a database server, we have a Reuters box that allows us to get access to the market, um, and we have these servers in dev, and we have the same kind of designated servers in prop. Um, so this allows me to say that, okay, if I need to run these on the Reuters box, I can just say, okay, well, I need to run it in prod first, sorry, in dev first, then in UAT, and then in prod. Um, but it also, uh, so you, right, to, to run the task in the environment, much like pre... I'm going to learn how to use this presentation software eventually. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, so much like groups dash G, environments are dash E. So I can now say that in the ops dev environment on the database machine, run my disk free command. Um, so environments are fun. Uh, but they're even more fun when you get into configuration. So now I can say in this environment, um, I have a random environment variable. I'll call it uh, datlib. Uh, and this is, I should call it deployder, but I called it datlib because that's what we referred it to. Uh, so this is our deployment directory. Uh, except in another environment, in this specific environment, it's something different. Um, and dealing with this in our build scripts was a pain. I was able to use Rex here to automate it. Uh, so I can say set, and this is the name of the variable, and this is the value. And then later in my task, I can say get, and I can get that variable, and then I can use that to run, you know, to restart our application. Because uh, this is where we deploy our application, so I need a full path, and I can get that uh, and set it appropriately. 
Uh, so the important thing to note is that this is all Perl code. Um, this is straight up subroutine. I can get any Perl module I want in here, and I can do whatever I want in here. Um, and indeed, this environment here, this is also a subroutine. So basically, the environment that I'm in, the subroutine gets run, and I can do whatever I want. So now if I just, uh, if I restart my app in dev, or if I restart my app in UAT, it works. Um, so one of the more advanced features is I can actually get tasks to run other tasks. Um, and this was important in my deploy because my deploy has seven or eight steps. And if any one of those steps failed, I want to start there and not way back at the beginning. Uh, so I can say that uh, when I update my application, I also have to restart my application. And I think I missed the slide where I introduced this. Uh, so you can actually say in a task what uh, group it should run in by default. Uh, so for example, if you have an app server or a database server and you have a task called restart app or restart database, you can say that by default this runs on the app server or the database server. So you don't ever actually have to specify what host this is going to run on. It'll run on the default, which is correct. Uh, but you can then, if you want to, override that to say, hey, I've got this backup database over here, and I need to restart that. Which I don't know where the slides went, but that's what I get. Um, so here I'm going to run the restart task on the same server that I'm connected to. So now I've got an update, which then runs the restart. And since the restart command, I can run that independently if I want, or I know it'll automatically get run when I update my app. Also, you can see here I'm doing some error checking. If the run fails, it sets dollar sign question mark like every other um, any other fork in Perl will set dollar sign question mark, and then I can die. So I can just say, I want to update my PC. It'll run in the default group in the right environment. Um, so tasks can get parameters as well on the command line. So if I want to, for example, create a task that will install a CPAN module on a wide variety of machines, I can um, use the module option. And I can grab all the modules. Um, so I'm going to allow comma-separated modules, and I'm going to join them with spaces instead, and then I'm going to run CPAN on all those modules. Um, so this was another very helpful kind of little three-line script that allowed me to easily install CPAN modules on a dozen different boxes with one single command. And that command looked like this. So I could say, run it on all the dev boxes, and here are the modules I want you to install because apparently I want both competing web frameworks at the same time. <laughs> at least I didn't install Catalyst. Um, and Rex can do a lot more than what I've said. Um, Rex can sync full directories. Um, there is a, an rsync plugin. Um, Rex commands rsync that lets you just sync. Here's the local www directory, and we're going to sync that to the remote var www. Um, Rex has more configuration. Um, so I was using just the set and get commands to do some configuration, but you can actually have um, an entire configuration management database. Um, lets you configure based on the host name, based on the environment, uh, based on the operating system. Um, this is much, uh, I understand this is much like Ansible works. Um, excuse me. And I know it's a much like uh, CF Engine works. Um, where a machine has a bunch of tags that says, okay, it's a Red Hat box, it's a Red Hat 5 box, it's a Red Hat 5.6 box, and you are allowed to basically combine all of these configs to say that, okay, if it's a Red Hat 5.6 box, the HTTP config goes in this directory. If it's a Debian box, the HTTP config goes in this directory. Um, so you can make sure that um, basically if the host OS changes out from under you, your HTTP conf is going to go into the right place. Um, unfortunately, I don't get into that because I do not have time. 
Uh, Rex has its own plugins. Uh, you go to modules.rexify.org, you get a whole plugin list. Um, not a lot of these are on CPAN for some reason, but uh, there is its own uh, little module thing here. Rex itself is on CPAN, so you don't have to worry so much about that. Uh, any questions? Yes? Is this a one at a time serial, or do you say, okay, go and do that on 100 servers at the same time? Both, actually. That is the second time someone asked that question. So I am actually going to add a slide about that. And this is why we do these things. Um, so you can actually, um, much like make, you can say dash J. You can do the same thing with Rex. Um, and Rex has a few underlying ways of doing that parallelization. Um, one of them I want to say is a naive fork. Um, and I know one of them is Gearman. So if you have a, a Gearman system set up, you can use Gearman to, uh, to splat your jobs over your entire network. But yes, by default, it is done serially. Is there a limit to the parallel you can run inside of uh, the functions there? Not really. I can't think of any like any like actual limitation. There's no like Im enforced limitation. It is just a Perl file. Um, it is run just with a Perl interpreter. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, um, contrary to what we were saying over there about Perl 6. Perl 5, it is actually really, really easy to make a DSL um, because, for the most part, Perl does not require that you have parentheses everywhere. So this task keyword is just a, a sub uh, with, a, you know, with a prototype. Um, it's just a, a sub like any other a function. Um, so no, there's really uh, there's really no limit. Um, like say you had a log file that was in a specific format and it was a specific Perl module that would read in that format really easily. Mm -hmm. Would you just have like a require or use statement in there and just use that module? Yeah, so I could if I wanted to. You no, you cannot. Okay, that's even worse. I thought I had this set up. Ah, that's why. Okay, okay. So if I can, if I want, um, you know, you. Then, um, my. You know, fine. And then I'll, uh, uh, it is, of course, important to note that this uh, that this sub uh, runs locally. Um, yeah. So then, mine needs to be. Here. Not right. Correct. So yeah. So while this 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 script will run remotely, it will then pipe all that content into the scaler, and then I can yeah do anything I want locally. That is actually an interesting idea. I get my my colleague. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. Right. So for the most part, it's just basically handled by SSH. So if you have your SSH config set up uh, and your keys set up and all that set up, it'll just magically work. Uh, if you want, you can specify password. Uh, and do that. Um, uh, like, for example, you might need to do that anyway just for uh, for upgrading to sudo. Right. Um, what was I just thinking of? Nope, I lost it. Oh, you can specify which keys to use. 
so for example, if you've got you know your normal regular user keys, but you need to use some admin keys to do it, you can say that I want a different kind of key. Um, you there's a uh, there's an idiom for using um, uh, a password. Uh, I do this. No, uh, not putting the password here, but asking for the password. And now I'm totally forgetting where I actually do this. Right, yeah, using using term read password to, to, to actually get the password. So, uh, let's see if I can find it. Let's look at my... Okay, it wouldn't be there... Maybe be here. Uh, so I actually got a bunch of uh, little tiny rec files here. Um, this one just deploys. I've got this app called Mercury. Um, this deploys a uh, a daemon. Nope, this doesn't use sudo. Where do I use sudo? Cvent testers. I was going to say, I knew I had done this recently, and here is where it is. I've got this sub called ensure sudo password, and I call that every time I know I'm going to need a sudo password. And um, I set the sudo password to basically I get this. I prompt the user, say, hey, I need a password to use for sudo. Uh, we're going to no echo that read line. We're going to read that line, and we'll restore it, and then we'll set the pseudo password to that. Um, so it's going to stay, you know, probably unencrypted in memory for a little while. But um, this ensures that, at the very least, it's not uh, unencrypted in the Git repository forever. Um, but also, it, it's because um, one of the one of the uh, one of the decent things about this is that you can then you, know, you can use your 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 uh, your your SSH logins. And you can even use your sudo, your sudoers file, to say that okay, these people are allowed to deploy the app in prod. These people are allowed to install, you know, packages in prod, uh, and that kind of thing. And Rex, Rex doesn't have to care. Uh, Rex doesn't have to worry about any of that. It just it tries to do it. And if the user itself is not allowed to, it fails. Ah, so this is uh, kind of an example of a larger, um, a larger Rex file. Uh, I have to, like, I've been doing all this set here, but I really want to get that into the configuration management database. Um, but, you know, so there's some uh, some tasks that I can run. Here's deploying the, the CPAN testers back end, and we ensure that we've got some directories, a log rotate conf. For some reason, log rotate is the thing that nobody does that is always the first thing I have to do when I'm starting to admin a system. Like, I don't get it. it, it it's, it's literally writing five lines in a log rotate conf and, and, and maybe setting a cron tab entry. Like, this isn't hard, people. <sighs> I don't. Um, you could. Um, Generally, uh, so so generally, my workflow looks more like I put my Rex file in with my project, and you know I, I do my project things, and then when I'm ready, I just run Rex deploy, and my project is deployed. Um, this uh, CPAN testers in particular has got this kind of global project wide file because there are other things to do. Um, you know, you have to uh, basically there's a bunch of different Git repositories that deal with the database. So I couldn't pick just one to say, here is the, the Rex file that installs the database. Um, but no, generally, I don't trust any code enough to, to run these kind of destructive actions on a, on a cron job. Um, it isn't like uh, CF Engine or, I'm not sure if Ansible works this way, but I know CF Engine works this way. Uh, CF Engine is more about ensuring that your system looks the way you expect it to. Uh, so basically, you declare in this file, this is what this machine must look like. And if it ever deviates from that, it'll switch back. <sighs> uh, 
Anyway, um, that's that's not this. This is more proactive about it. Basically, this is I need to do a task on a machine, um, and it just so happens that I'm going to check whether or not that task is done first. Um, has anybody else? Has anybody used Ansible? Because I've not. Is yeah, that we, kind of how Ansible works? We use it pretty long in work. Yeah. Oh, Gabriel wants to talk about it. Uh, the, I think I'm broadcasting now. Um, this is Gabriel. Um, yeah, we use Ansible quite a bit, or at least a little bit. And it's kind of, it kind of encourages you to develop it in such a way to where it won't, like, completely destroy things, so it's not supposed to be destructive. It's supposed to be this declarative way to say, this is what I want my server to look like, but in the end, it, it allows you to just shell out <laughs> and do whatever you want. <laughs> right. So it, it tries to it tries to get you to not do that, but in the end, I mean, you can still put an ARM dash RF and 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 so there's right. still that that kind of unsafeness yeah. in it. We had that. Uh, so another bank story. Um, while before we uh, started using Rex, um, we actually built our own Ansible in Perl. Uh, which we called Draco, uh, and we tried to get them to let us open source it. They didn't because lawyers are lawyers. Um, um, but in the end, it looked very much like Ansible, and then it had a YAML file. It said uh, you could declare, here are the directories, here are the files, here are their sources, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and that works, except when you do need to shell out, okay, well, now you can do anything, and now it's not declarative anymore. Now it's you're executing something, and you can't be sure that doing that same execution twice is going to result in the same output. Um, Rex doesn't like have that distinction. You are simply executing something. It's up to you. Uh, your developer, we trust you. You know, go forth and develop. Um, though I will say that using the CMDB that I barely touched on, you could build Ansible using Rex, which um, I have not done yet. And please don't ask me to, because I'm probably going to do it anyway. <laughs> So yeah, it's not um, it's not doing any, any safety mechanisms or any any um, any kind of conventions to make sure that it's uh, item potent or however you pronounce that word. Any other questions, comments? All right. Uh, so one of the I guess. It's 8.12, and which means that took another 30 minutes, which was close. But um, one of the fun things I did in here was, um, so I actually cat out the current cron tab and then compare it to the previous cron tab because I can't be sure whether or not anybody has ever edited this. Um, and so if there's no changes, it'll just it'll install it. But if there is changes, um, it'll ask me whether or not I want to install it. Uh, and I indeed do that for the entire CPAN Tester's web app. So it will actually run a, a recursive diff over the entire application directory. Uh, again, same reason. Um, which, yeah, I'm not like proud that I have to do this, but I'd rather do this than accidentally destroy all of CPAN testers, which every time that goes down, I realize more and more exactly how much everybody actually uses that thing. <sighs> all right. Well, thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I will. Uh, um, I'm available on IRC. I've uh, I've got a Twitter. I've got the GitHub's, uh, and I'll put these slides up on the meetup for y'all. Awesome. Which means I have to do a commit.